to an international lawyer's perspective on Talata, hosted by Quorum Chambers and Expatriate Law. In this, the first webinar in a series looking at all aspects of international family law, our speakers will take a deep dive into the world of Talata, sharing tips and practical hints for managing beneficial ownership issues. I am Melanie Batra Samuel, and I'm your host for this lunchtime. Our speakers are Oscar Smith of Expatriate Law and Greg Williams of Forum Chamber. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about both of them. Oscar is a specialist in international family law, advising clients uh, following the breakdown of relationship. This includes high net worth separations, international children disputes, financial relief after a foreign divorce and jurisdiction disputes. He is a resolution accredited specialist in cohabitation cases featuring Talata and also in complex high net worth financial remedies on divorce. Greg is a barrister at Quorum Chambers. He's been at the Bar of England and Wales for uh, approaching 16 years and he practices exclusively in financial remedies, Talata and Inheritance Act cases. He's been described by the Legal 500 as one of the few who can tackle a cohabitation case as well as a Chancellor Barrister would, and by the President of the Family Division as an expert in the field of Talata. Greg was the first member of the Family Law Bar Association to be invited to speak at the Chancery Bar Association's International Conference on Trusts. He was in Bermuda, and that was just before the COVID outbreak, and I'm a little bit jealous that Family Law don't have conferences in Bermuda. Oh, God, I guess we do sometimes, but... Very exciting. Next year. Next year. Next year. Next year. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, a lot of Greg's work is advisory as well as advocacy, and he also sits as a private FDR tribunal, both for money and to law to schedule one cases. So let's begin. Uh, I'll be asking a series of questions to our speakers. Um, I'll be addressing it to one, but I suspect that the other will chip in and they'll probably be battling it out to get their points across, and that's absolutely fine. Um, it's up to them to talk to us. Um, if you, the um, listeners, have any questions, please put them in the chat box um, and we'll get to them hopefully uh, at the end of the webinar. And uh, if you have other questions that aren't addressed, you can always email them to events at quorumchambers.co.uk. We'll put that email address in the chat box so you don't have to worry about that for the moment. Right. Are we ready to begin? Speakers, yes, ready? Yeah, per right. perfect. <laughs> perfect. So the first question, um, Greg, let's start with you. In terms of the act itself, what are the powers under Talata that we should be looking out for? Well, um, the act itself is relatively straightforward as statutes go, uh, certainly by modern standards, a relatively short uh, act. Um, the, the probably the key sections to look out for are sections 14 and 15, and I probably, if we've got time, which I think we will, I'll mention briefly um, sections 12 and 13 as well. So if you're bringing a claim in England and Wales under Talata, as I'll call it for short, um, it, for an order in respect of um, property, whether that's for an order for sale or for declaratory relief for beneficial interest, um, then you'll be bringing that under section 14, um, which gives the court effectively the power to make such declaratory relief as it sees fit um, and even to override the wishes of any trustees or any other beneficiaries. Um, so when you've got two people and they can't agree on how to deal with the property, then by its nature, you're applying under that section um, as one of them in order to override the wishes of the other. So that, that's relatively straightforward. Um, and in the second section that's important is section 15, which contains a very short checklist of factors that the court has to have regard to in determining uh, an application for an order under section 14. And uh, as I always say at this stage, it's not exactly the section 25 factors. Um, it, it's a relatively short uh, checklist, um, really goes to the intention of the person or persons who created the trust, the purposes for which the trust property is being held, which could be, for example, the family home, that may inform the court's decision whether or not to sell it at any particular point in time. Uh, the section 15 also looks at the welfare of any minor who occupies or might reasonably be expected to occupy the subject property as their home. Um, and actually the, the, the statute uses the term minor. Uh, it doesn't say child of the family. So if you've got uh, separated parties and you've perhaps one of them's in a new relationship, 
um, and they've got new children with a new partner, um, the court has to have regard to the, the children occupying that property, not, not, not necessarily giving first preference to a child of the family. So that, that's an important distinction, uh, which is worth making. Uh, and of course, the court will also have regards to the interests of any secured creditor or any beneficiary. So th those are the kind of the key go to sections that you'll need to have a look at if you've got a Talat claim in England and Wales. Um, it's also worth mentioning sections 12 and sections 13, um, which come under the subheading rights of beneficiaries to occupy trust land. And section 12, which is relatively short, is the right to occupy. And it sets out that a, a, a beneficiary who's entitled to an interest in possession is entitled to occupy the property and it's got to be, the land's got to be kept available by the trustees for that purpose. Um, I should say, of course, that in many, many cases in which you will deal, uh, the trustees and beneficiaries will be one and the same people because two people can purchase a property for themselves jointly. And that means they will be both their own trustees and their own beneficiaries. Um, section 13, is quite lengthy, but, but in very brief terms, it sets out the powers of trustees to impose obligations on people, for example, the beneficiaries who live in the property. Um, and uh, in a sense, it's the codification of some of the equitable accounting principles, the occupation rent principles, which if we've got, got time and if we're given a question about it, we might have time to dip into later. Um, but, but it gives the um, court the power to order that compensation be paid where somebody's in occupation, perhaps excluding somebody else, uh, and set what that might mean. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a little bit of background to the actor. I don't know if that's uh, is what you're after, Melanie. You're on mute, sorry, Melanie. You're muted. Oh, I, I knew somebody was going to do that. It had to be me, didn't it? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Ray. That's exactly what I wanted because I wanted to be short and sweet because we've got quite a few questions to go on to. Um, and the second one is going to be uh, for you, Oscar. Um, many family law practitioners still find Talata cases challenging as they are not used to doing them as often as they are, for example, as divorce managers, remedies, whatever. So what are your tips when you see a new Talata client? So uh, the way I, I deal with a first meeting with a Talata client is I, I try and think of it as just really it's an evidence gathering exercise because one of the, the key aspects of Talata is, is you're, you're trying to work out two key questions first of all generally, which is who are the beneficial owners and then once you've got all the evidence, what, what are their beneficial interests? I mean those obviously Greg covered off all the other aspects of the act that it covers, but those are the two kind of critical questions. So at the outset, you're, you're speaking to your client and gathering the evidence to answer those questions. So you need to be thinking really carefully about, you know, making sure you obtain a conveyancing file as soon as possible. Um, and I don't just mean a file that gives you the TR1, uh, and I always find that conveyances are reluctant to hand over their entire file, but that's what you need. You want all the correspondence because that can give you some really good evidence about what was intended at the time. Was it both parties communicating with the conveyancer? Was it just, just the one? How, how did the, the purchase operate? Um, other key evidence you need, obviously, that the land registry title, so you can look at the restrictions, but then it's really important also to delve into the detail of all the relevant bank statements, um, which show who funded what towards the purchase, improvements, and then, of course, mortgage contributions. Um, and I find that in a first meeting with a client, they can often be um almost muddled as to what happened when and who paid for what and how much they paid i tend to not kind of bamboozle them with too much law i don't start talking in detail about trust but what i'm doing is giving them the opportunity to tell me what they think happened because then you get a much clearer sense of of the intentions of your client um without being guided by you if you start telling them how important intentions were and 
you, you can end up in a position where they're trying to gather from you what will present their position in, in the best possible way. What should they say to you? Um, whereas what you're looking for is an honest account of what happened and, and that can stop you getting in a, in a muddle later down the line. Um, and then I guess the final tip is once once you've had the first meeting, you're gathering the evidence and you've got it, ideally before you've even written to the other side, set out any position at all, I always recommend my clients that we go and see Greg or, you know, usually Greg, uh, to, to get proper advice from counsel so we can formulate that letter before claim and present a consistent case from day one. Uh, the worst thing you can do is fire off a letter and then your client produces a piece of evidence that completely contradicts what you've already said about the property. Um, and then you're backpedaling from day one and that will be used against you throughout the entire set of proceedings. So if possible, you don't fire off letters until you're absolutely clear on what your position is. And it does mean front loading the case, but I think, you know, that that is the reality that you need to do to make sure you're, you're starting off in the best way with any Talata case. Can I, can I just jump in um, and follow on from what Oscar said there, because I, I agree with all of that. Um, I'm picking up on, on that very good point about getting to the client's actual intentions, because ultimately, as all of the authorities make very clear these days, the, the search of the exercise is to try to get to the actual common intention if possible, that's that's what the judge is entitled to do. And as we as we all now know, the court isn't entitled to impute an intention to the parties unless um, you know if, if it can find what their actual intentions are. It's got to go with that, um, and it can only impute an intention as to quantum if it's first found that there's a share in principle from conduct. Um, I mean, the thing the thing that I always find, and the the, the, the joke that probably Oscar and I repeat to ourselves is that you know we we're always talk about common intention. Um, and it's really a bit of a misnomer because the common intention is supposed to be objective. Oscar's client will sit in his office saying, well, this is what I think happened. This is what I remember. This is what I think we agreed. And another party will be sitting in another sister's office telling them a completely different version of events. And somehow the judge has got to come up with their so-called common intention. So the, the takeaway point is that it's the court's objective exercise of trying to conclude what the parties actually did attend, intend from their actions and conduct if if of course there isn't an express agreement or even better an express declaration of trust yeah i, I agree with all of that greg and, I, and that's why i say it's so important to let your client talk and tell you what they their intentions are without guiding them too much by telling them what the law says about it because otherwise you potentially in a bit of a mess exactly right I'm, I'm going to move you guys along to the next question, if that's okay, unless you have something that you want to add. No? I'm sorry, I'm going to be a bit of a, I'm going to bully you guys so we can get through all the questions, because there are some really interesting ones that are coming up next that I want to hear about. So the next question, um, when faced with uh, or advising an intervener in divorce, what are the most important things to consider? And Greg, I... I think I'd like you to start on this one. Well, so uh, as, as many of you will know, and I can see some familiar faces in the audience, quite a large part of my practice is dealing with intervener uh, claims, trials of preliminary issues. Um, so whether you're acting for a husband or a wife or whether you're acting for an intervener, um, you'll all be familiar with the guidance set out by um, Mr. Smostin, it was a case called TL and ML, it was shortly before he became a full-time High Court judge, so it's technically Nicholas Mostyn QC. Um, but in 2006, Mr. Justice Mostyn, as I shall call him, gave uh, pretty far-reaching guidance about the need in principle to have a trial of a preliminary issue before you have your FDR. Because how many times have we been as an FDR and we're trying to negotiate and we're not on level ground because somebody's saying, well, this asset is owned by so-and-so somebody else. Um, and it's really, really hard to have uh, a, a full and effective negotiation when you've got a backseat driver in the room. Um, the idea being, if you can have a preliminary issue hearing, you can knock out that preliminary issue because the judge will make a finding. You can get on and you can have your, your smooth FDR. I know, I know there's a bit of a debate about that. We all know how bad listings are. And I suspect Oscar might have 
something to say about that. But in principle, that's what Mr. Justice Mosman says should happen. And in the majority of cases now, in my experience, it does happen. Um, and it, of course, adds an extra layer of bureaucracy and cost to the process. But sometimes it's essential. Um, so, so a couple of things I'd just like to sort of mention on this topic. Um, first of all, you've got the question of joinder. Um, family procedure rules, of course, um, provide for joinder. It's, um, rule 9.26b, if you're really interested, you can go and uh, look at what the actual rules talk about at adding parties to the proceedings. Um, you, you can frequently get invitations for parties to join the proceedings. You can have orders for parties to join the proceedings. Um, and when they are joined to the proceedings, if they're joined to the proceedings, you should ordinarily go through the process of doing pleadings um, and getting orders for disclosure. Um, and it was Mr. Justice Mumby, as he then was in a 2007 case called A&A, &A, it's always stayed with me, where a wife's claim uh, in respect of an intervener horribly failed. She got an indemnity costs order made against her. And the, the judge said something like, you know, that the, the, the weaknesses in her case would have been more pitilessly exposed if they'd been subjected to what they called the intellectual discipline of pleadings. So um, you will find that in some of your cases, um, it is, it, in fact, I, I was just in all of your cases, um, it should be common practice to have statements of case, points of claim, points of defense, so you can tease out what the legal issues are. Um, and that should be all the more case in international cases, because you might have questions of whether it was common intention trust, whether it was a resulting trust, whether there was no trust at all, but it was a loan. Uh, and so getting these, these key facts bolted down in statements of case at the beginning is really, really crucial in the vast majority of the cases. And then, of course, you can flesh it out with the evidence in a witness statement later. Um, at risk of going on for too long, I think I'll just very briefly talk about another Mr. Justice Mostyn case, which is the Fisher Meredith and JH and PH case. Um, and it, that's a case which you should all go to if you're ever in any doubt about on whom the duty to join a party lies. So in that case, a uh, husband had transferred assets out of the jurisdiction to his aunt. Um, and he said originally the assets which were shares belonged to his uncle and for some reason given them back to his aunt. And actually when his aunt was questioned, she didn't even know why she'd been given them. Um, but there was an issue in the proceedings about whether the aunt should have been joined to the proceedings at an earlier stage and whose fault it was on to join them. In fact, the wife, by the first instance, judge was held that she should have joined the aunt. And in fact, her, her solicitors were held to be professionally negligent for not having done so. Um, and to the relief of that um, reputable firm and to their insurers, Mr. Justice Mostyn overturned that decision and said that actually the duty wasn't on the wife to have joined the aunt, if anything, on the facts of that case, it probably should have fallen on the husband because he was asserting that beneficial ownership belonged to somebody else when he had previously been the legal owner. Um, so the cases will vary, um, but uh, that's that's a bit of a nutshell, really, on intervener cases, if that helps. Um, Greg, I I just wanted to pick up on the point you made from TL and ML, which is the you're supposed to have the preliminary issue trial before the FDR. And this is an issue that I find often quite difficult to grapple with as, as a practitioner, because if if you do follow that guidance you end up incurring huge costs before the FDR which is often the best chance of settling and I often think in these cases where you have you, intervener cases it's very normal to have one of the parties to the marriage very much supportive of the intervener's case and the other one opposed to the other two and so they generally know what their positions is I, I take your point about teasing out the the complex legal arguments and statements of case but where you have a case where it's perhaps a bit more straightforward legally um i i find it beneficial where possible if if you've got a sensible opponents on the other side to try and arrange some sort of roundtable meeting early neutral evaluation or, or whatever you want to call it an f private fdr early before that preliminary issue um, and that can often lead to a breakthrough and, and settling of these cases where you don't necessarily have a, a complex argument over a legal point uh, or, or a complex legal point. Um, and I, I think that can be a way to, to deal with these cases more proportionately. But I think given the guidance we have, it's very clear that judges don't necessarily agree with that. Um, and and I think we 
it, it, but it's very tricky when you've got an eye on, on costs and perhaps the intervener's claim is not that high value. Um, if you're going all the way to an FDR after pleadings, you've probably incurred two thirds of the entire preceding set of fees before you've even started ne to negotiate. So I don't know what your experience is of having those early negotiation meetings. Do you, do you find that they work or with an intervener case, do you find that's almost impossible? Well, I, I take the point it's very well made, if I may say so. I think I think um, you know, there, there are judges at the fulcrum of, of the family court, at district judge and circuit judge level, who you know wouldn't want to go on the record as saying this, but would would probably recognise that the guidance does create additional cost barriers. Um, and you know, for, I, I, the, the thing is, it's also subjective. I mean, we've all had cases which are eminently capable of settling. Uh, and we've all had cases where we've gone to an FDR and had a completely pointless exercise because the judge has said, oh, well, there's a dispute of fact here and I'm not in a position to resolve it. And so it's very, very difficult for me to pick between the two positions. I mean, if you're going to get a judge at FDR level who's got a busy list, who's basically going to say, well, there's a dispute of fact, what do you expect me to do? Then you're much better off going to see a private FDR judge or an early neutral evaluator who's actually going to look at papers and give you a bit more thought. Uh, it seems to me that if you've got a straight dispute of fact, and there is a tribal issue to be resolved. It's always hard to settle those cases where two people are swearing blind the polar, polar opposites of, of, of the spectrum of facts. Um, but, but if you've got to actually a common ground in terms of facts, but the parties don't really agree the law, it might be that that's quite sensible to, to, to have sort of lawyer to lawyer discussions because you will find clients will be led by the lawyers, they'll be led by the law. If you say to your client, well, look, on balance, I think this is a constructive trust case, and therefore, on balance, I think the outcome is likely to be this. And you know, the other side are possibly going to agree with that. So, shall we try and find a range, if you like a landing zone for settlement? Yes, of course, that that can and does happen. Is it cost efficient to try and settle it as quickly as possible? Of course, it is. Um, I would never argue against that. It's just unfortunately had the experience of sitting in FDRs previously, where um, you know it's not been possible for the whoever the judges um, could be best judge in the world to give. A really valuable indication um, because of this dispute of fact, which is still there. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to move you guys on to the next question. Um, and this one is going to be for you, Oscar. So um, focus. <laughs> what are some of the best tools in the CPR to help your case? Okay, so. The CPR, obviously, we're all family lawyers, so we don't tend to like to have to use it, but it but it's actually a really useful um, set of rules, and it can be your friend. It's it's not necessarily your enemy. Um, and the, the first point is, of course, the pre-action protocol. Um, and everybody knows that there are there can be cost consequences if you're not following it. So just make sure you do follow it. But it, it's not just a, a box ticking exercise. It, it is an important um, it is important to follow the rules because they are good rules. They are saying you need to basically know each other's position, um, consider whether this is settleable without proceedings, and consider ADR. And all of those things are very sensible. That's all set out in. I think it's rule six of the the pre uh, the, the pre-action protocol. There is no set defined pre-action protocol for Talata cases. It's just the general one. Um, turning to the CPR itself, some of the more kind of international issues. Um, the first one that many people have to grapple with is, of course, service outside of jurisdiction. So we're looking at part um, four of CPR rule six, um, and and. It is quite straightforward. You just simply follow the rules. And generally speaking, you need to be serving um, the defendant in accordance with the rules which are local to them, um, wherever they are based, which means getting foreign advice. And I can't recommend that, that enough because the last thing you want to do is to start a claim um, and find out at the first hearing you've actually you've not served them correctly or that they're, they're contesting it. Um, and so just getting that foreign advice and finding out what the local service rules are is best. Um, the foreign process section at, at the High Court is an exceptionally useful resource. Um, I often 
ask a paralegal to call them with certain questions because they they are generally very very useful um so so use them as well and you can serve through them through the central authority but that can take four to six months so it's best to serve in accordance with the local method as well um some other key aspects you might need to translate documents you need to do your statement of service and m510 uh, when serving outside um, and there are different time frames for the response which are in the practice direction to 6 uh, 6b i believe it is 7.2 the table um, the rules are very important to follow and if you don't you need to apply for relief from sanctions under cpr 3.9 i just give you an example of um, for example, if you're going to be filing a defence late, make sure that you agree that with the other side or you make an application. Um, whilst default judgment under part 12 is not necessarily applicable to all aspects of a Talata claim as it relates to mon monetary claims, um, you, you've just got to be aware that these rules are hard rules. You cannot just breach them in the same way that some family lawyers treat the family procedure rules. Um, another interesting part is um, for, for international cases, security for costs at, at Rule 2512. Um, if you represent a defendant who um, is the legal sole owner of a property, um, and a claimant is seeking an interest in that property and that claimant is, is based outside of the jurisdiction, you may have an issue um, getting your costs paid if you believe that they have no interest in the property and um, you're successful. And so an application for security for costs can be a really useful interim application to make because it forces, it, it kind of forces the claimant to show that they're not just a nuisance claim, that they are very serious because they may be ordered to put aside a set amount of money as security for the defendant's costs in the event they do not succeed in the claim. Um, and the rules on that 2513, um, I believe, sets out some of the conditions. So if, if the claimant is based outside of a 2005 Hague country, they're not based in one of those, you have issues with enforcement and so that that's the type of case you need to think about dealing with a kind of international talata matter um i'm not going to talk about things like the cost rules i think we're all very very clear that cost rules are different in talata they they follow the event um and of course there is part 36 which as one of the early strategies, making an early part 36 offer, particularly once you're clear on what your case is and after you've gone to see counsel and, and you've got Greg's sign off, um, making that early part 36 can be a really, really good way to put the other side under pressure um, and to get, get a settlement earlier rather than later. Um. If, if the only thing I could possibly add to that, that was very comprehensive, is just, just to bear in mind that um, it, we're used to, in the family procedure rules, of course, part 28, and in fact, rule 28.3 specifically disapplies part 44 of the CPR. In other words, the principle that costs follow the events does not apply to financial remedy proceedings. That, that this application uh, does not apply to uh, to trials of preliminary issues involving interveners. And so it may well be, uh, in fact, the starting point is what we call the clean sheet approach. And there's case law that would strongly suggest that um, costs would follow the event in those circumstances, a case called Djokovic. Um, it goes back to the early 1990s, Lady Butler's loss. So um, worth pointing out that in, in uh, cases involving interveners, uh, particularly if they've got a Talata element, you may well find that costs are alive issue and you'd be well advised to get your N260s in clear 24 hours before any tribal hearing. And I think that's a, a really good point Greg and it also goes back to my point if you can settle early before incurring those you know pleadings the costs for the pleadings if you can do an early FDR type hearing um, it's worth exploring. Yeah absolutely. Thank you both that was very thorough. Um, next question is um, for both of you, but I'm going to start with Oscar. Um, 
what happens when an English property is subject to a foreign claim, such as in a foreign divorce, and a third party seeks an interest in the property? So uh, that's a very complicated question with no straightforward, simple answer. And that's um, why I'm asking you first, Oscar. Um, so let well if we talk for a scenario you might have a couple who are getting divorced in let's say France and one of their assets is that might be a, a jointly owned property or, or it could be solely owned by one of them um, in England and then you also have a third party who says that they own a share of that English property um, and that presents the situation where if they were getting divorced in England, we would be dealing with that in essentially intervener proceedings. We wouldn't be dealing with it under Talata, albeit intervener has obviously the lots of aspects of Talata within it. Um, so what, what then happens? Because you could have Talata proceedings in England over that property, um, and then you could also have the argument in France. Um, and I think the, the biggest take home bit of advice when this is the situation is to make sure your client gets early advice in the other jurisdiction, because it will, it will really depend on uh, what, what law applies in, in whichever jurisdiction is the potential conflict. Um, and for example, in, in France, and, and I believe in some of the, it might be all the other EU jurisdictions, I think it certainly in France, they would look to try and apply, it's almost applying English law to that asset to work, but within the, the French system to work out what to do with it. Um, and and I, I always find that an odd, um, an odd point that a, a foreign court would deal with an issue, but applying a different set of laws when surely if that were the case wouldn't it be better to deal with that issue under the laws of if, if it was England using English law in the English courts because no doubt English courts are going to understand English law better than for example French courts where the, the concept of property ownership via trusts just doesn't really exist at all. Um, but you can see that you can you can set yourself up where there are two potential sets of litigation um, and if uh, I'll talk a little bit about EU law, um, and you might ask why, but I'll, I'll tell you at the end. But for example, a divorce in France, the Brussels II regulation would apply because it's, it's matrimonial. Um, so in terms of scope, um, but query whether a third party bringing a claim against a married couple's property would still fall under Brussels 2 or whether it would fall under Brussels 1 which is kind of other civil uh, contractual disputes I don't I don't necessarily know the answer immediately to that and and then Brussels 1 also has some interesting information it says that the courts of a member state in which a movable property is situated should have the exclusive jurisdiction um, over um, relief which are rights in REM, so rights against the object or the thing rather than rights against an individual. Um, and the UK of course is not no longer a member state, England is not a member state, so why does this apply? Well there was, you cast your mind back to towards the end of the transition period and there was lots of talk about whether or not we would become a signatory to the 2007 Lugano Convention. Um, and these provisions under Brussels are mirrored in that convention and we so far have not joined that the Lugano convention and I'm not sure what the latest update is but it looks like we are not but if we did then those provisions could potentially uh, apply which is why I just flag them. Um, there are other situations you, you get some jurisdictions um, where if a couple divorce is there that jurisdiction will just say, well, I, I'm not going to deal with an English property because it's totally outside of, of the scope of what we can deal with. We can't put in place any enforceable orders. We will not deal with it. So a, a divorce in the UAE, for example, generally does not make orders under over English property. And it might be that there's no part free claim um, available. The parties may not be domiciled in England. Um, and, 
and it may never have been the family home. And so it, it might be you then fall back onto Talata to deal with the issue of, of that property. Um, Greg, I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments about um, well, I, we, we had a case, and we're not going to talk about anything confidential live on air, but we, we had a case some years ago, didn't we, Oscar, where the parties were based abroad, divorced abroad, um, there was property in England, but it wasn't ever the family home, so there wasn't any question of any Part 384 Act application, um, and in the end, um, you know, the, the focus of the issues, if I can put it in the most general sense, focused around trust principles and, and Talata, didn't they? So. Yeah. That's, a, that's an obvious example of where um, you may need to engage Talata, even if the parties are based abroad and divorcing abroad. Um, and it, of course, it, you know, the facts fact will depend on the actual case. Um, I guess the other thing just to say is just to develop a little bit, if we've got if probably just about got time, this point about rights in REM and rights in persona. So immovable rights in property, personal rights. And there's quite a lot of case law on this. It's, it's not, not a particularly easy um maze to navigate the way through but there's there's a well-known case called Magira and Magira it's a 2018 court of appeal case my colleague in chambers Mike Horton QC appeared in that case um, and that was a case where there were divorce proceedings in Poland um I think uh, actually no, take that back there was divorce proceedings originally in France but there was the equivalent of financial remedy proceedings in Poland um, and the wife had brought Talata claim to sell English property and the question was whether the English court um, should be dealing with it, um, or whether those courts were, uh, those, those proceedings ought to have been brought in Poland. Uh, and ultimately, um, the English court did, did find it had jurisdiction to deal with it. It found that at first instance, um, and then there was, in this uh, period between the first instance decision and the appeal, there was a European Court of Justice decision called Comu, which um, uh, had something to say on the matter, and, and for, for that reason, the appeal was um, dismissed and the original decision was upheld. So um, the, the English court decided that it did have jurisdiction because the subject of the properties here, here in England were rights in REM. So it's always worth um, getting into the details of those sorts of cases. Um, more recently on that point, um, there was a case just before Christmas last year called Heslop. Um, those of you who are interested in these things, um, Heslop and Heslop, it was a chancery decision uh, at master level, and it was a it was a probate dispute um, about a, an estate and property in Jamaica. But the beneficiaries all lived in England, as I understand it. None of them were domiciled in Jamaica, and so one of the questions was whether the English court could deal with um, the question of the beneficial ownership of Jamaican property. Um, and cut a long story short, the, the, the court in England found that it could. Um, and two central pro protagonists were based here; they weren't domiciled there. Um, and the court held that it did have jurisdiction to try the claim. So it might be worth um, having a look at that if you've got any similar cases. And Greg, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but that Heslop case actually said that they, they believed that the um, directing a trustee to sell or transfer property is, is a right in personam, even though it's over a property, it's because it's directing the trustee in person to do that, that action. It, it, I believe that that was the, the finding. Yeah, I think that was exactly what was said, is that if, I, if I've got my extract correct, nonetheless, in personam orders could still be made against the trustees of the foreign trust. That's exactly right. Does I have um, anything more to add on the foreign aspect? Oh, I mean, we could go on all day about this, but yeah. I, think, I think probably if, if there's any more questions, we better. Yeah, move I on. agree. Uh, we do have a few more questions to go through, and I can see the clock is ticking. Um, the next question is about occupational rent, and uh, it's going to be for Greg. Um, occupational rent is argued in many cases, often without justification. When is it appropriate to argue occupational rent? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing I'd, I'd do is just set out what occupation rent is. Um, so it, Lord Newberger, who was the only dissenting judge in Stack and Dowden, gave really the only relatively recent forensic analysis of occupation rent. Um, and he said that analogous with trespass damages, occupation rent is uh, compensation for loss of use and enjoyment. 
And he said that there's really two ways in which you could quantify it. One way would be um, the notional rental value of the property, and the other way would be the cost of alternative accommodation. So I suppose in the in the domestic context, somebody leaves the property and they've got to rent around the corner while their ex-partner is still living in the property, then um, cost of alternative accommodation might be more applicable over here. Um, if you're dealing with international clients, um, if the parties are based abroad, um, it seems to be much more likely the court will deal with occupation rent, uh, if it deals with it at all, on um, the notional rental value point. And I think Austin will have something uh, briefly to say about, about what share that might be. Um, but uh, th th there, there are a few things. Um, th there's a bankruptcy case, which I think is probably quite relevant even for international practitioners, because um, it was a case called French and Bartram. It was a court of appeal case for 2008. Um, and it made the point that um, an occupier doesn't have to be an occupier. Sorry, forgive me, I'll start again. A beneficiary doesn't have to be a beneficiary who's going to occupy the property in order to claim or be able to claim occupation rent from the other co-owner. So a trustee in bankruptcy wouldn't be expected to go and occupy a property, but that doesn't mean that they can't claim for occupation rent if the other beneficiary is sitting in it. And that might be a particular relevance if you've got a party who's based abroad. And if the argument is deployed, oh, well, you know, they're living on the other side of the world, they wouldn't ordinarily come and claim it. So why should I be paying them occupation rent? The argument would be, well, they don't need to. The fact of the matter is they're the beneficial owner and they should get their proportionate share of the notional market rental value. So um, that, that's not an international case, but it's analogous. And it, I, I would suggest that could be quite useful. Um, and the, the only other thing I, I think I'd probably say at this, this stage is um, in terms of um, the notional rental value, um, you may well need expert evidence on that. Uh, you may need that expert evidence to go back in time, depending on how long you're claiming for. I think where occupation rent claims get weaker is if they try to go back too far, because they can quickly, particularly for dealing with London properties, um, build up very, very quickly if you're talking about what, what the rental value of a particular property could have been. And if you go try to go back too many years, depending on the facts of the case, you suddenly deal with a very large amount of money. Judges get a little bit um, itchy about, about granting too large a reward. Of course, a claim for occupation rent could be offset um, by the party in possession paying the mortgage on behalf of both of the parties. So that's worth watching out for. And it's possible, although it's not an absolute rule of law, to have a set off between the interest paid on the mortgage as opposed to the claim for occupation rent. So um, I could probably develop that if, if there's any particular questions, but that's a a high level overview. Yeah, I, I think occupational rent is quite an interesting point because in the majority of the Talata work that I do, when when the parties are no longer living in the property, it, it gets claimed and, and clients get quite hung up receiving something in lieu of occupational rent. And you have to talk them through very carefully and, and check whether that that rent anyway would just be offset as Greg says by the mortgage payments or the other kind of critical payments that have to be made on the property the insurance and the service charge for example um has got to be paid and if the other party's paying for all of that then you know you're you're offsetting the occupational rent claim so it's important to set your client's expectations um and normally what you would do if you if you were pursuing occupational rent is is to appoint an expert a single joint expert to do an open market rent um valuation and it's based on the percentage interest that your client has in the property so if they have 40 percent, they should receive 40 percent of the market rent but it's offset so you could see how occupational rent arguments often become potentially disproportionate and I, I've I've not dealt with a case where it's been um, where occupational rent has been the 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 issue that ends up pushing the case you know really far deep in, into proceedings because it's it's usually disproportionate um, and so I think making sure you manage client expectations at the beginning about what they may be due as per occupational rent is really important. Thank you both for that. Agree with that. Thank you both for that rundown on occupational rent. I'm going to move you along to the next question because I can see the clock is ticking and I want to give us a little bit of time to answer questions um, from the listeners. So the next uh, question is going to be for Oscar. Uh, 
and it's about declarations of trust, uh, which is um, declarations of trust in laws of proceedings. Do you consider them to be a curse or a blessing in these sorts of cases? So, um, so a declaration of trust um, is, a, I'm sure you all know, a document that basically sets out the beneficial ownership of the property, what, what should happen to it. It can talk about when it should be sold, what conditions, who should contribute towards mortgage payments, um, how contributions towards um, payment of outgoings or improvements will affect beneficial interests, if at all. Um, and it, it's a bit, I guess, a slightly odd question. Surely, if you've got a declaration of trust on a case, that's that's that. It's done. Because Goodman and Gallant, um, a case from the mid-80s, tells us that a declaration of trust is conclusive, save for fraud, mistake, or duress. And, 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 and it's rare that you will find one of those vitiating factors. So um, a declaration of trust in theory should be a real positive. However, sadly, in my experience, I find that the documents that people present to me as declarations of trust are often really badly drafted. Um, and and my, my firm view is that family lawyers should be drafting these, conveyances should not, um, and they should be comprehensive. They should be covering off all the issues that I talked about. What happens? Cover, cover those changes in circumstances, because otherwise you inevitably have a document that one or the other party finds unfair. Um, I've, I've had so many cases where a client has signed up to a declaration of trust, giving them a really pitiful share of the property, and they didn't really know what they were signing up for. Um, and they can be very disappointed when I tell them, well, it's a binding declaration of trust. It's very difficult for us to find a way out of it. Um, so they can be a curse when a client presents you with a document which may or may not be well drafted. And um, I think there's a big, what I experience is conveyances um, will, will provide a kind of almost, they've Googled the law on on tenants in common or something like that they've googled that copied and pasted it into a document and then sent sent that document along with a declaration of trust and told the clients to go away and take legal advice on it and i just find that that is such an insufficient way for for people to you know manage how they're buying what is probably going to be the most valuable asset in their life um, and it's so important that they get it right and spend a little bit of money on a family lawyer drafting it properly um, so that it's fair and, and it's covered off correctly. Um, but wh when you do have a declaration of trust, as I say, and, and if it's done properly, that that is really the end of, of the matter. As long as it covers off everything, um, you know, it, it, it means you don't have to litigate. So that it's worth spending a small amount of money in advance than potentially falling out with someone and ending up with tens of thousands of pounds and, and Talata proceedings. Um, there's one other thing I would add to that, which is um, if you take the case of an intervener, um, a TR1 form, for example, box 10 acts as a declaration of trust, you tick the box, joint tenants, tenants in common or whatever, um, and so that would bind the two purchasers, let's call them the husband and the wife. Um, if you've got uh, a case where the bank of mum and dad is wading in or a granny overseas or whatever the case may be coming and saying, well, actually, I was intended to have a beneficial share. The fact that the declaration of trust is as between the husband and wife wouldn't necessarily bind the granny. So the general proposition is that there's no scope for the imposition of what we call implied trust. In other words, constructive or resulting trust where you've got a declaration of trust a declaration of trust prohibits that but of course it wouldn't bind the third party you know it's all, a third party such as an overseas granny is always entitled to come along and say well hang on i didn't know anything about this i gave the money and i was told i would get a share so there are there are some circumstances um where it's possible to argue around a declaration of trust yeah and um i i think the the other point to make is because if you have international clients the concept of of how we organize property law in this country with legal and beneficial ownership can be very confusing for them 
Um, and so it's for those types of clients, it's even more important, particularly, as Greg says, when you have third parties potentially paying in money um, to buy a property, everyone should really be taking advice. And um, very straightforward documents like a declaration of no interest um, can deal, can prevent that intervener cl claim in the future. Um, and and if a third party is supposed to have an interest in the property, then again, it should be by that de declaration of trust. Um, but of course, people like to avoid that for various tax reasons and things like that, I believe. Um, very, very quickly, if, um, if anyone has got a case on at the moment where they're trying to rectify a declaration of trust, um, to rescind the declaration of trust and rectify the register, there was a case last year in the Court of Appeal called Ralph and Ralph. It's about rectification. Um, and it's almost impossible to summarise the Court of Appeal decision in a few words. But what it basically said was, if a judge is rescinding a declaration of trust um, and, and, and setting it aside, um, then the court has to go on to make a finding as to what the parties actually intended. What you can't do is take away the starting point by getting rid of the declaration of trust and leave a vacuum where nobody knows what's actually going on. The first instance the judge should be invited to find them if that wasn't the party's intention, set aside the declaration of trust, what were the party's intentions, find that instead. So that's a, that's a pro tip if you've um, got a case on rescission and rectification at the moment. Thank you for that. Thanks both. I'm going to ask the last question um, and then hopefully we can get um, any other questions in from the listeners. The last question is uh, for Greg. Can you tell us a little bit about the underlying beneficial ownership of property severance of joint tenancies and any particular pointers about that? Um, yeah, and I'll try, I'll try and do it quite quickly. I mean, I think most people will be familiar with the concepts of legal ownership and beneficial ownership. Um, the beneficial ownership obviously doesn't have to, to mirror the legal ownership. That's why we have these hidden trusts. Um, and I suppose if you've got a beneficial joint tenancy, which is always quite hard to describe and define, but, but it, it, you know, people say it's about a group of beneficiaries all owning the whole, and it's almost, almost impossible to sort of map out what that looks like. But imagine you have uh, four friends who all own a property together as beneficial joint tenants and one dies, then the three remaining uh, friends all uh, still own the whole. And then if another one dies, then there's two owning the whole. And if the third unfortunate one passes away, then the, the sole remaining friend still owns the whole, so it's passing it uh, across by survivorship, whereas if they're beneficial tenants in common, they would all own separate and distinct shares, perhaps 25% each if that's what they've agreed, uh, and as each one respectively passes away, the 25% share would go into their estate to be distributed by their will as they see fit. So that's that's really the, you know, what we're talking about. Um, the, thing, the thing to sort of pick up on is that the beneficial joint tenancy uh, can be severed in certain circumstances. It can be severed unilaterally by one of the parties, it can be severed by conduct, which is sometimes a question of construction of the facts. Um, it can be severed by bankruptcy. Um, it can even be severed by charging order. So there's a case going back to, I think, 2009, uh, High Court case, C. Putnam and Sons and Taylor, which says that where, for example, a creditor gets a charging order over a property, it would sever the interest, the beneficial joint tenancy, and only attach to the share of the indebted party. So th these are important things to be aware of. I mean, you may well act for a client abroad who may have invested into a property uh, and then found out that while they've been away, that their co-owner, their relative, their cousin or whatever, has actually charged that property or has done something. You may want to look at principles of equity of exoneration to try to protect your client's interest or whatever the case may be to try to make sure that somebody isn't disadvantaged by the conduct of their co-trustee and co-beneficiary. Um, I think we're probably out of time. If, I, if we weren't out of time, I'd tell you all about a case called Raven Dark, which came out for um, Christmas. And it was, it was a case about um, the, who was the true beneficial owner of a big mansion in Surrey. Um, and it was owned by a company that was owned, lent money by another company that was owned by a Russian oligarch. Um, and it's all about resulting trust. It's going for a retrial, so it's probably worth watching out for. Um, but I think that's probably, probably as much time as we've got, isn't it? Thanks. Thanks for that, Greg. Um, 
we have one question in the chat box that I'd like to ask, and anybody else can always email us questions at the email that I will put in the chat box in a minute. But the question is, if various properties were purchased 20 years ago in one party's name and there is limited documentary evidence of initial financial contributions, what other avenues can be explored in terms of evidence? And I think this goes back to us at the beginning saying, front load your preparation before going ahead with this. Do you guys have any comments? Yeah, I, I, I'm always quite surprised at what you can dig up um, through the land registry. Um, and it's worth, um, I, to be honest, I haven't been on the kind of solicitor's portal myself for some time, um, but it, it's worth exhausting every document that you can obtain from the land registry about the properties and you can request historic transfer documents and things like that um, and you never know what might come up um, it might give you some information sometimes you you hit on you're lucky to receive some information but it's it is very very difficult if you cannot get bank statements um, there's the conveyancing file is long destroyed and it's essentially what each party says they believe happened 20 years ago it's very very tricky i don't know if you have any other tips greg uh, it is it is really hard to get um to, to go that far back i mean some banks can make historic statements available on special application um it's always worth trying um, I suppose really if you're dealing with something that far back, um, look for emails. I mean, plenty of people have got Gmail addresses and Hotmail addresses and Yahoo addresses and that sort of thing that show their age perhaps um, that go all the way back and there may well still be emails of intent lurking in there, um, perhaps even expressive intent, you know, of course you're going to have a share darling, that sort of thing. Um, or some evidence of other detriment. I mean, maybe you've not got precise payments and sometimes it's because cash payments are made and those are always the tricky cases but there might be some correspondence between the parties there may still be in an e email inbox somewhere that will show either evidence of intention or detriment or both thanks very much oscar greg we're going to wrap up because it's almost two o'clock and i'm conscious that everybody wants to uh go back to work and get on with their day um Yes, we will have a recording of this webinar up on the YouTube channels of both Quorum Chambers and Expatriate Law. So if you want to listen to this again, or you've missed parts of it, or you want to double check something you heard, you can always go onto those YouTube channels and hear it all over again. There won't be any written notes, but you will have access to the, the webinar. Um, keep an eye out for the next webinar in this series, which is going to be on Monday, the 14th of March at 1 p.m. And it's going to be about uh, finances and international family law. And I think that link is coming out end of this week, beginning of next. And all that's left to say is thank you very much to Greg and Oscar for um, giving us all this information and doing so in a quick, concise manner. Thank you very much. Thank you.